The following is a presentation of Tomorrow's World. We've all heard stories of people being deceived by con men. Too often, innocent people have handed over their hard-earned money to these fraudsters. You know, from time to time, we'll hear warnings from the police about such criminals. But the problem is that con men are able to change their names and appearances like a chameleon can change its color. Until they're locked up, they're a real danger. Now, most of us would not believe that we could be the victim of con men, but so also did those who have been deceived by them. Is it possible for someone to get past your defenses and convince you with some get-rich-quick scheme? Don't be too sure that you couldn't be conned. Discovering that you've been deceived is a humiliating experience. Being deceived by religious deception is particularly so. Maybe you know of someone who has given up on organized religion because they were deceived by a smooth-talking preacher and pledged $1,000 to him, believing they would be blessed by God for doing so. Yes, being deceived about what we believe is a serious business, and in today's program, we're going to examine the subject of belief and deception. We're going to discover that there could be something we have been taught as being true, but does not necessarily agree with what the Bible tells us. You need to know that there are counterfeit religions existing today, and you need to be sure that you can recognize them. Do you want to be sure that you're not being deceived? Then stay tuned. A very special welcome to Tomorrow's World, and especially so if you're joining us for the first time. Here at Tomorrow's World, we aim to take the Bible at its word. We believe that it's God's handbook for mankind, written by the one who created us. We believe that the Bible is true and without error. We trust that God is powerful enough to ensure that his holy word has been preserved for those of us living in the last days. We're also aware that people can twist scriptures to make the scriptures say what they want it to. And for that reason, one of the hallmarks of this program is the expression that you will hear us often use. Don't believe us, prove it to yourself from your own Bible. Please be sure to follow along with me with your own Bible today. And you may even wish to write down the references to read later. There are many sincere people who read God's Word, but the problem is that much of what they've been taught and believe can't be found in the Bible, but rather is based on old Greek and Roman myths. Most people don't understand that Satan the devil has been deceiving religious people for a very long time. In fact, let me ask you this. Who were the first ones to be deceived by the devil. Why, it was Adam and Eve, of course. In the Garden of Eden, they rejected God and believed the lie that they would not die if they ate the forbidden fruit. Remember the serpent said to them, you shall not surely die. But that was a bold-faced lie. But our parents believed it. Did you know that the Bible actually tells us that the, that the devil is the God of this world. Let me read it to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Once again, turn there with me if you have your Bible with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 3 and 4. So here we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he warns them, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds, look at this, 
the God of this age has blinded. Satan knows how to blind and deceive people. Don't be fooled. He knows the Bible better than all of the most learned theologians put together. It's his mischievous and devious mind that leads people into any number of falsehoods and lies. He knows the scriptures, so he can twist them just as he tried with Jesus Christ during the temptation. But there will be a time when he will be forcibly restrained from being able to deceive humans. His fate will be to be chained up by God for 1,000 years while Jesus Christ rules on the earth. We're told in the book of Revelation that he'll be cast into the bottomless pit, shut up, and a seal set on him. We're going to read that in Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to start here in verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Did you see that? He deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Believe it or not, Satan has established his own religions which have led their believers back into the old paganism of the Babylonian mystery religion. And to help you see just how this has happened, we have a booklet that will reveal to you the process by which so many people have been deceived. You need to know if you're among those who have unknowingly accepted beliefs that are not biblical. A person who is deceived doesn't know that he or she is deceived. Believe it or not, if an ancient Babylonian priest came back to life today, he would be amazed at how many of his beliefs and practices can be found in many of today's churches. So request our free booklet, Satan's Counterfeit Christianity. Call the number that we will give you or go to tomorrowsworld.org to order your copy. In today's program, we're going to take a look at how ancient pagan practices crept into professing Christianity. As we do so, ask yourself the question, does this really matter to God? Does it matter if we carry on some of the old pagan ideas of worshipping the rebirth of the sun at springtime? Is God offended by Easter bunnies and eggs? Maybe that is just harmless fun, but is it? We're going to see that God strongly denounces the worship of the sun as it was practiced by the Babylonians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And when we come to see that the old sun-worshipping beliefs are now being kept under the name of Christianity, we'll need to choose whether we will continue to follow these ways. Are you ready to find out some important facts about Easter? Then keep watching, because what you are about to hear will amaze you. In the second part of the program, I'm going to give you some startling truths about the practices that we've grown up with and never questioned. The purpose for me doing this is to challenge those of you who are honest and sincere in your religious beliefs. I know that there are tens of thousands of you watching who aren't afraid to accept a challenge. What response will you have when you clearly see that you and millions of other people are involved with customs that the Bible tells us not to be involved in? So be sure to stay with us and come back after the break. To receive this program's offer absolutely free, or if you would like more information, visit our website online at tomorrowsworld.org. Once again, that's tomorrowsworld.org. Or you can write us at the address shown. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Tomorrow's World magazine keeps you up to date with world trends, Bible prophecy, and the very meaning of life itself. Tomorrow's World. Call now. 
Welcome back to Tomorrow's World. Today we're facing up to a challenge that comes directly from the Bible. It has to do with the timing of the days of Easter as well as the accepted practices of this religious season. Most of us have been raised to believe that Jesus Christ died on Good Friday and rose on Easter Sunday. But is that true? The fact is that the Bible tells us something quite different. Let me show you clearly what the truth is. Matthew's Gospel records a conversation between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees. These Jews wanted him to give them a sign that he would show them that he was the Messiah. Follow me as I read Matthew chapter 12 and in verses 38 to 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days, notice this, and three nights in the heart of the earth. Did you hear that? Three days and three nights. It doesn't say three days only, as most people would assume. It says three days and three nights. Now, let's do the math for the accepted Easter times. Friday night, that's one night. All day Saturday and Saturday night is just two nights and one day. If Jesus Christ died on the accepted Good Friday, three days and three nights would have him being resurrected at the end of Monday. You know, you can't squeeze three days and three nights into a Good Friday, Easter Sunday scenario. It just won't work. But someone might say to me, yeah, but Friday, Saturday and Sunday, that's three days. Really? Remember, we didn't read three days, did we? We read three days and three nights. And Jesus said it was the only sign that he would give them that he was the Messiah. You know, this isn't some small issue, friends. It's a vital test to the truthfulness of Jesus Christ's words. Notice what the Companion Bible says about this important scripture in their appendix number 144. We read there, the fact that three days is used by Hebrew idiom for any part of three days and three nights is not disputed. But when the number of nights is stated as well as the number of days, then the expression ceases to be an idiom and becomes a literal statement of fact. What is at stake here is the truth of what we're taught about Easter and what is a literal statement of fact. We can't have it both ways. Either the single sign that Jesus Christ gave that he is the Messiah is true or it isn't true. He said he'd be in the heart of the earth, that is a reference to his tomb, for three days and three nights. The Companion Bible goes on to prove from established Jewish reckoning that there were 12 hours in a day and 12 hours hours in a night, making up what we call a 24-hour day. For example, the biblical expression, the third hour of the day, means nine o'clock in the morning. But in our modern reckoning, the third hour of the day is 3 a.m. If you're counting a day beginning at midnight, you may wish to do a more in-depth study on the subject and you'll find that Jesus Christ died at the ninth hour of the day. That was three o'clock in the afternoon of what we now understand to be a Wednesday. Let me show you on this chart when Jesus Christ died, when he was buried, and when he rose from the dead. Remember that he died at 3 p.m. on Wednesday, and his friends had just three hours to bury him before the high day Sabbath, which was the first day of unleavened bread, got started. That day like all days in the Bible, began when? At sunset. You know, Joseph of Arimathea was given permission to take the body down from the cross and bury it in a tomb that he owned. The body of Christ was in the tomb by Wednesday night. Then came Thursday, that's one day, and Thursday night. Then there was Friday, which was the second day, and Friday night. And then all day Saturday, with Jesus Christ's resurrection occurring right 
at the end of the Sabbath day. And how long was that? Well, that's exactly 72 hours or a full three days and three nights. He actually rose from the dead just before sunset on the following Saturday. And according to Jewish reckoning, the first day of the week then began soon after sunset. We're familiar with a day starting at midnight in our world today, but this is a Roman invention, and it's not what the Bible uses. A biblical day begins at sunset. We can become confused unless we understand this important fact. Now, there's another vital fact for us to understand which day was the preparation day for the Sabbath that started at sunset just three hours after Jesus Christ had died. Now, most theologians make a very important mistake by assuming that the preparation day was on a Friday before the weekly Sabbath. If they do, they're wrong. Because I want to read to you an important scripture in John chapter 19 and in verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. What does it mean, a high day? It means one of the special annual Sabbaths of God. This, in fact, was the first day of unleavened bread, which happened to fall on a Thursday for the year of the crucifixion. Let's consider this again. Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. He died at 3 p.m. and was buried just before sunset that day. The next day, Thursday, was the first day of unleavened bread, followed by the second day of his burial, which was the Friday, and then the weekly Sabbath or Saturday. He rose at the end of that Sabbath. Is this important to you? It should be. What most people who believe they are a Christian do not know is that the origin of Good Friday to Easter Sunday has its origins in an old Babylonian myth of the death and the rebirth of the sun god named Tammuz. In the next part of the program, I'll be revealing just how the worship of the sun to bring back life to a cold, dead winter has been the strongest pagan force for more than 4,000 years. To understand more about the clever deception that has been forced upon unsuspecting Christians, request your copy of Satan's Counterfeit Christianity. You can call the number on the screen or you can go to tomorrowsworld.org to order your personal copy. You'll be amazed at how many beliefs that you thought were in the Bible are simply not there. So, call now. To receive this program's offer absolutely free, or if you would like more information, visit our website online at tomorrowsworld.org. Once again, that's tomorrowsworld.org. Or you can write us at the address shown. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Tomorrow's World magazine keeps you up to date with world trends, Bible prophecy, and the very meaning of life itself. Tomorrow's World. Call now. Welcome back to Tomorrow's World. On today's program, we've been exploring the origins of accepted Christian belief and practice. In the first part of the program, we discovered that a Good Friday to Easter Sunday scenario simply cannot fit the prophesied three days and three nights that Jesus Christ said he would be in the tomb. We're now going to see that an ancient Eastern god by the name of Tammuz and his mother represented the rebirth of the sun so that regenerated life could be brought back to a cold winter landscape. Let's hear what a British author tells us about Tammuz and his mother, Ishtar. 
Sir James Fraser was a British scholar of ancient Eastern religion. In his book, The Golden Bough, on page 325, we read the following. In the religious literature of Babylonia, Tammuz appears as the youthful spouse or lover of Ishtar, the great mother goddess, the embodiment of the reproductive energies of nature. This goddess Ishtar has given her name to, you won't believe it, Easter. Continuing on, Sir James says the following. We gather from them that every year Tammuz was believed to die, that the two might return together to the upper world and that with their return all nature might revive. So the rebirth of life at springtime was celebrated on the 25th of March in ancient Rome. The Romans borrowed their religion from the Greeks, who in turn had received the Tammuz myth from the Babylonians. The Greeks, however, called this sun god Adonis. Did you know that Christianity has perpetuated the old Babylonian false religion in the Easter sunrise service? It was customary in ancient Babylon for women to weep and to cry for this young sun god Tammuz, but then rejoice at his rebirth on his day of worship, which was always on a Sunday. And that's why we call the day of the sun, Sunday. Could anything be plainer? Is God concerned about worshipping the sun? You'd better believe he is. You may not know this, but the Bible gives us a warning about this. In fact, it's right there in the book of Ezekiel. The ancient prophet of Israel, Ezekiel, says about such pagan practices as women weeping for the sun god Tammuz. We're going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 8, and we're going to read verse 14. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Once again, who was Tammuz? He was the young sun god and also the son of the queen and goddess Ishtar. Remember, she's the one who gave us the name of Easter in English and German. Please listen carefully as I read to you verse 16. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And what were they doing? and they were worshipping the sun toward the east. I'm almost certain that you didn't know that sun worship was condemned in the Bible. But you also didn't realize that sun worship is the origin of Easter sunrise services. You know, God is repulsed by the worship of the sun. Why? Because he's the creator of the sun. The moon also and the stars. He says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. We must be very careful not to mix pagan worship of the creation with the true worship of the Creator. To change the name of Tammuz to the Greek and Roman Adonis, and then to find it being applied to Jesus Christ, is frankly offensive to God. How many more pagan practices have found their way into professing Christianity? Call now for your copy of our booklet for today, Satan's Counterfeit Christianity. We will give you the number on the screen so that you can order your personal copy. Is it possible that we could have been deceived into a false religion? Mostly it happened without us knowing it, just like our childhood belief in Santa Claus. Imagine how it is then when you now realize that some of what you consider to be so-called Christian is really old pagan belief. When we first realize that we haven't been told the truth, we, well, we just can't believe it. How could it be that the great world of Christendom didn't know about this? But what's even harder to accept is that when we explain it to friends and acquaintances, some will simply shrug their shoulders and say, so? So what? I've known all along that Easter is Babylonian and pagan, but it doesn't really matter because all of that old pagan religion has now become Christian. But it does matter. And God tells us in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2, Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven. 
If you want to live your life according to God's will, you'll be wanting to know if you've been believing error. Now, some people don't seem to be too worried when they become aware that their beliefs are not in accordance with what the Bible teaches. But others, and I, and I really do think that, if I might say, I'm speaking to those who really do sincerely want to make a change in their lives, who have been convicted and convinced by the scriptures and also the other information that I've given to you. So what should you do if you wish to sincerely obey God? I'm going to give you three vital keys to bring your life into harmony with God's will. The first key is this. Go to God in prayer and tell him that you want to seek him in every way in your life. I can assure you he will answer that prayer because he is seeking a people who want to obey him and him only. The second key is to study the Bible with understanding. Once again, we will read what Isaiah reveals about the person whom God is looking for. In the second part of Isaiah 66 verse 2, we read, But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Now the third key is to obey God. Many people say, I will obey God when I understand, but God says, obey me and I will give you understanding. If this program has been a challenge to you, request our free booklet, Satan's Counterfeit Christianity, and bring your life into harmony with God's will. Join us again next week when Roderick Meredith and Richard Ames will present more important information for you to consider in your quest to serve and obey God. Wallace Smith and I will also bring you helpful instruction from your Bible to apply in your life. Until then, goodbye, friends. To receive this program's offer absolutely free, or if you would like more information, visit our website online at tomorrowsworld.org. Once again, that's tomorrowsworld.org. Or you can write us at the address shown. To view today's program, order the free literature offered, or for more information on today's vital subject, visit us online at www.tomorrowsworld.org. The preceding program is produced by the Living Church of God.